Okay, I'm just uh, waiting for all of our participants to get online. And we'll start in half a minute or so. Okay, I think we'll start. Um, good day to everyone. Uh, good evening to those of you in Israel. Um, good afternoon to those of you in the United States. And also, I suppose, uh, in uh, Europe and other places. Um, my name is Paul Gross. I'm a senior fellow here at the Menachem Begin Heritage Center in Jerusalem. Uh, and this is the latest in a series of um, Zoom meetings and webinars that, that um, I've been hosting here um, for the past uh, six or seven months, really, um, ever since uh, the Begin Center had to uh, close its uh, doors to, to uh, actual public events. Um, like the rest of the country and most of the world, of course. Um, and we've had a lot of different uh, events and speakers online as part of this series, looking at different issues around Israeli politics and Israeli history, current affairs. Um, we've had some wonderful guests and today is no exception. Uh, today we're going to be discussing the uh, US-Israel relationship and the next chapter of that um, all-important uh, part of the of Israel's um, national national story, uh, the most important, uh, obviously, diplomatic and security relationship that Israel has, and a major plank of of Israel's national security policy, um, and it's and very very much its its uh, place um, its place in the in the diplomatic arena. Um, some of you will recall that before the presidential elections, we had on here Professor Jonathan Reinhold from Bar Ilan University talking about the election and what it might mean um, if either um, then President Trump or and then uh, candidate uh, Joe Biden won. Um, now we've had the election, Joe Biden is the new president of the United States uh, and we can discuss uh, what that means for Israel and the US rela Israel relationship. And we have two fantastic um, guests with us to discuss that, one from an Israeli angle, one from an American angle. Uh, and without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first um, speaker for, uh, for today, uh, Danny Diane, who was the Consul General of Israel in New York, uh, a position which also um, included um, coverage of New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and, and Ohio. Previously, he served as the Chairman of the Council of Jewish Communities in Judea and Samaria, the Yesha Council. Uh, for more than two decades, he was chairman and CEO of a group of information technology firms. Uh, he has an MSc in finance and a BSc in economics and computer science. Um, uh, he's also, of course, those of you up on Israeli politics, um, running in the uh, coming elections with the uh, new New Hope Party, Tikva Chadasha, of Gidon Saar. Uh, I should also say that Danny Diane has the distinction of being the first guest on this Zoom series um, who was also the parent of a previous guest. Um, many of you watching this will recall uh, the discussion I had uh, a couple of months ago now with the um, hugely impressive uh, Ophir Dayan about her experiences as a Jewish and Zionist activist at Columbia University. Um, I, I think uh, Danny was watching that and got a lot of nachas from that. And um, Danny, I know that this, this sounds like an odd thing to say to someone uh, of your achievements, but you, but you set a very high bar for you to for you to clear this evening. Um, anyway, without further ado, I'm gonna pass over to uh, Danny Diane. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Paul. Great to be here at the Begin Center, even if it's uh, virtually, um, as a great admirer and uh, disciple of Menachem Begin. And uh, it's, uh, a, big, a great honor for me to share the screen with my good friend, David Makovsky. Now, if I have to describe uh, the way I see the Israeli-US relations in the coming four years, um, in two words, I would use the term cautious optimism. Um, I know, I want to be very clear. The next four years will be very different to the previous four. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Uh, the kind of uh, 
In Timasi, uh, some would probably use a different word in order to describe the relationship between the President of the United States and the Prime Minister of Israel. It will not exist, and uh, I don't think that uh, the same kind of uh, relationship would exist with the senior, uh, uh, with the senior staff in the White House, in the National Security Council, in the State Department. Uh, probably in defense uh, is a different story. Um, but uh, that, say, that being said already that the relationship will be different, uh, in no way I believe that they will be bad. I think we will we have uh, a potential of a very good relationship with the Biden administration. Um, I would say this: um, if I look at the probable uh, at the candidates uh, in the primaries of the Democratic Party, if I look at the scene at the the myriad of leaders that the Democratic Party has. I believe that the Biden-Harris ticket, the administration led by President Biden and Prime Minister and Vice President Harris is the best democratic administration Israel could have hoped for. Um, now, the, as I said, the relation will be different to that that characterized our relationship with the Trump administration, but the, that is clear, that is obvious. But I think that the most interest, interesting question is not that. The most inter interesting question is whether the relationship with the Biden administration will be similar to the administration in which Joe Biden served as the loyal, a very loyal vice president for four years, namely the Obama administration. And uh, there are those that uh, believe, explain that the Biden administration will be at the third term of Barack Obama in general and regarding Israel in particular, and I beg to differ. I believe that if it will be a third administration, it won't be Barack Obama's third administration, but Bill Clinton's third administration. I see much more similarities between Joe Biden and Bill Clinton in general and regarding Israel in particular than between uh, Joe Biden and uh, uh, Barack Obama. I think that Joe Biden has a positive, a very positive predisposition towards Israel. Um, it comes from, if to use uh, an Oxfordian term from his kishkes, and um, I think that uh, uh, we, the relation has all the potential to be a very positive one. Uh, now, of course, it depends. Uh, I, I see um, a lot of uh, news in the last days about uh, senior staff in the uh, Biden administration um, that uh, some Israelis uh, are worried about. Uh, probably there is reason uh, for one nomination or one, one appointment or, or two. But if I look at the, first of all, at the leading, uh, leadership of the Democratic Party, Biden, Harris, Pelosi, Schumer, and I look at the senior officials, the top officials of the administration, uh, Secretary of State Blinken, National Security Advisor Sullivan, um, uh, Chief of Staff Klein, I think we uh, have friends in the White House, in, 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 in Foggy Bottom. Now, um, it depends obviously on uh, many things, on many parameters, including the question that we don't know who will be the Prime Minister of Israel after March uh, 23rd. Um, um, there is a fear in Israel that, uh, and I will try to evade the, the fact that I am a candidate um, in my remarks, but uh, uh, there is fear that Israel will pay a price for uh, its too close relationship with the uh, Trump administration. Um, I cannot say that there is no reason whatsoever to believe in that, but uh, if we talk politics and not diplomacy, if we talk politics 
I believe that Israel and Joe Biden have a common um, interest, a, polit a common political interest. And the common political interest of Israel and Joe Biden is to weaken, to debilitate the radical wing in the Democratic Party. I looked very carefully at his nominations. I saw Senator Sanders uh, sitting alone in what already became a, a, a source of innumerable memes. And uh, I couldn't fail to notice that there is no even one uh, Sanders, even Warren loyalist uh, uh, in the Biden cabinet. And that means, that for me is a very important sign. And it means that we have a common interest here, uh, uh, a, a common political interest. Now, uh, obviously uh, the, the President Biden took, entered the Oval Office probably with the heaviest burden of issues on his shoulders since World War II. Um, the pandemic, the economic uh, crisis, the racial tension, the, the social tension in the US. Um, I think that uh, uh, the, in the, the, the time that the President Biden will have to deal with foreign issues, uh, foreign relations will be very limited. Um, and I also think that since uh, the, con contrary to what uh, we saw in the past, um, the Middle East is relegated uh, to fourth or five or fifth slot in his uh, uh, in, 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 in international issues. I think the most important is China, and there are many others like uh, uh, repairing the relationship with the European Union or with NATO and others. Uh, and since the Palestinian issue needs, uh, in order to make serious advancements, personal uh, uh, involvement of the president, I don't see President Biden becoming involved uh, in his first year or two in the so-called peace process. Um, we will have, obviously, uh, differences of opinion in the issue of construction in Judea and Samaria and building in Judea and Samaria. One interesting uh, thing will be to notice whether uh, President Biden will uh, adhere to the Obama administration policy regarding construction in East Jerusalem, or will be more uh, lenient, more considerate on that, like the Clinton administration, with the exception of Al Homa, that was a, a very a hot spot. Uh, that will be interesting to look. Uh, no doubt the Israeli government will have to maneuver in the issue of construction. I don't, uh, even if I see uh, the, the, the Biden administration trying to, uh, uh, to, to do some uh, 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 confidence building measures towards the Palestinians, I don't see a demand of a complete freeze as we saw with Obama because there is no negotiation inside. Um, the only, the, the most important issue regarding the Middle East that President Biden will be forced to tackle soon will be obviously Iran. And uh, those Israelis that uh, illusion themselves that, uh, uh, the, that President Biden will not make a, a strong effort to return to the JCPOA, they are doing exactly that. A wishful thinking. Every single democratic candidate that would have become president will strive to return to the JCPOA. And the big question, and there are mixed signals regarding that, is whether Israel will succeed diplomatically to convince the Biden administration not to return to the JCPOA as is, but to make a, a very wide, uh, to, 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 to carry a, a, a very tough negotiation uh, in order to achieve a, a extensive amendments to the existing JCPOA, uh, not limited to the so-called sunset clauses, the expiration dates of the agreement, but uh, uh, further on, and um, uh, also uh, covering an, uh, different issues that are not covered in the JCPOA, I, see, I think that that will be an achievement if Israel succeeds in convincing together with our allies in the Gulf and others, the Biden administration, 
to negotiate toughly and not just to compliance and then negotiate. A, a, a brief final remark. Um, one of the litmus tests that uh, we can uh, uh, follow in order to see uh, how, uh, what is the strategy of uh, the Biden administration regarding Iran is their attitude towards Saudi Arabia. The attitude of the Biden administration to, towards Saudi Arabia will be very telling for Israel's interests. Um, Saudi Arabia is not uh, popular with uh, Joe Biden and the Democrats because of the human rights violations, because of uh, the war in Yemen, and because of uh, uh, the, in, the unfortunate incident that happened in Istanbul, to put it in a diplomatic way. Um, if uh, that overcomes, overrides the American interest to form an alliance between uh, the, the US, Israel, the Emirates and others uh, to, to, to contain Iran, uh, if uh, that doesn't happen, it will be a bad sign. Uh, I hope that uh, they uh, uh, overcome their animosity towards Saudi Arabia. And my last remark is this. Um, um, I will be probably a little bit blunt. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and our embassy in Washington, rightfully or, or not, were perceived during the last 12, 12 years as almost registered Republicans. Um, I, I am afraid that uh, Israelis forgot in some sense to speak fluent democratic. Uh, Democrats speak a different language than Republicans. And uh, you have to adapt quickly. You have to understand that the Democratic Party of 2021 is very different from the Democratic Party of, let's say, Hubert Humphrey or uh, I don't know who. In those days, it was enough probably to, to, to say a few nice words about uh, Martin Luther King and uh, 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 to show some respect for the LGBTQ community. Today, in order to really bond with the Democratic Party, Israeli leaders and, them, and, and diplomats need to understand the new Democratic Party, need to understand the African-American narrative of, uh, again, I'm not judging now, I'm just describing of systemic racism and, and police uh, 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 violations of their rights, et cetera, et cetera. They have to understand the Latino uh, um, narrative regarding immigration, that there are no illegal persons, but only undocumented persons, et cetera, et cetera. I hope that my friend, uh, my good friend, um, Gilad Erdan, um, overcomes that hurdle and also the hurdle created by weird Israeli politics that he's a part-time ambassador in Washington, that will be a very serious handicap. That will be a very serious uh, a, a weak point in his tenure, both in Washington and in New York. Thank you. Danny, Diane, thank you very much for that. Um, that's a great opening to the conversation. Um, I should have said it in my initial introduction um, that you are all, uh, of course, invited to submit questions in the Q and A uh, box at the bottom of the screen, uh, and at the end of um, at the end of the presentations of both of our speakers, um, I will um, select uh, um, some of those to, to read out. I see that some people have already started writing them. That's that's great. Um, okay, um, to our next uh, speaker, David Mikowski, the Ziegler Distinguished Fellow at the Washington Institute and Director of the Project on Arab-Israel Relations. He's also an adjunct professor in Middle East Studies at Johns Hopkins University. And in 2013, 2014, he worked in the office of the US Secretary of State, serving as a senior advisor to the Special Envoy for Israeli-Palestinian negotiations, uh, as well as numerous uh, essays and monographs on issues related to the Middle East peace process and the Arab-Israeli conflict. He is also the co-author with Dennis Ross of Be Strong and of Good Courage, how Israel's Most Important Leaders Shaped Its Destiny, uh, which came out, I believe, last year, uh, which is a great read. I recommend it to everyone. It includes a very uh, nice chapter written by David on Menachem Begin. 
Uh, and he also wrote with Dennis Ross, um, the Washington Post bestseller, uh, Myths, Illusions and Peace, Finding a New Direction for America in the Middle East. He's the host of the podcast, Decision Points, the US-Israel Relationship. Um, should be of interest to anyone um, watching this, of course. And I uh, warmly recommend you check that out in wherever you um, uh, subscribe to podcasts. Um, and that, that podcast features interviews with authors, scholars, and practitioners on key moments in the, US, in the history of the US-Israel relationship from the Balfour Declaration to high-tech cooperation today. Uh, before joining the Institute, Mr. Mikofsky was an award-winning journalist who covered the peace process from 1989 to the year 2000. He's a former executive editor of the Jerusalem Post. He was diplomatic correspondent for Haaretz and is a former contributing editor to US News and World Report. He's a native of St. Louis, Missouri, and he has a uh, bachelor's from Columbia University and a master's degree in Middle East studies from Harvard. Over to you, David Mikofsky. Thank you, Paul, very much. Thanks for organizing. It's an honor to be with my friend, Dan Danny Dayan uh, on this session. Um, and I wanna thank the Begin Center um, because for the book that I did, we have a slide on that. Uh, and it's now out in Hebrew too, I should say. Um, the chapter, uh, I wrote the Begin chapter and Drawer by Yosef of the, the Begin Center was very helpful to me uh, with my research. I wanna thank Drawer. I had uh, several conversations with Gerald Steinberg, who I believe is affiliated uh, with you guys as well. So, uh, and the book is now out in Hebrew. Uh, it's Dymatsky's and other bookstores. Uh, so whether it's English, Hebrew, audio, whatever, Kindle, whatever you want, uh, I hope you'll find that interesting. What was, you know, the greatness of Begin, the idea of the book was to identify really four leaders of Israel who really made historic decisions and really trace their human journey and uh, the, the policy journey to big decisions. So Begin, uh, we saw was one of those four. So anyway, I hope people like the book. I think you'll learn there's some new material there. Uh, declassified Mossad dele, uh, memos even about uh, the Morocco talks before Sadat's visit, a lot of State Department material that has uh, not come out yet. So, but I really want to say this not as a commercial, but just to thank the Begin Center um, for the efforts. Look, I agree with a lot of what Danny Dayan said uh, here. And I don't know if we have a slide here about Biden, but I mean, Biden is someone, I would call him a, you know, a, pr a president of Israel, of the United States, who's, who's a Zionist. Um, he really thinks the world has a moral obligation to Israel's existence uh, after the Holocaust. Doesn't mean Israel, of course, doesn't have a, a birthright uh, to the land that predates the Holocaust, but he does take his grandchildren, I think, to Dachau when they turn 15. Um, and uh, he just thinks it's a moral commitment. It's not just about interest, uh, it's about common values. And I think that's really important. And that's what Danny said. And I just, uh, you know, I was nodding my head when he said it, because I think he's right. Look, the brilliance of Israel has been historically to understand that ties with the US are not an either or proposition. It's based on common values and common interests. And common interests were clear. The enemies of the Jewish people were the enemies of America. If you go back to Adolf Hitler, the enemies of the Jews, the enemy of the United States. If you go to uh, the Soviet Union uh, during the Cold War, the enemy of the Jewish people, the enemy of the United States. You look at jihadi terrorism, the enemy of the Jewish people, the enemy of the United States. That sense of commonality of interest has defined the US relationship really since its inception, and it has grown over time in depth and breadth but also an equal pillar and Ben-Gurion and everyone understood that and Begin understood this, which is it's not just about common interests, it's about common values. And I feel that the common values is what Danny was saying, is something that has not been emphasized enough in common years. You can say, well, maybe that's because you had, uh, you know, Prime Minister Netanyahu and, and President Trump and that was the commonality of interest. And I know Israelis tend to think, hakol interesting, everything is interest. But with Americans, it doesn't really work that way. It's both. It's not either or, it's both. And I think what, da what Danny said about talking Democrat, that's how, that's how I interpreted what he meant. It doesn't mean the US and Israel should uh, mute the common interest, not at all. 
uh, Iran is, is part of that. You have to emphasize that, but it should not come ex at the expense of also talking about the commonality of values. That I think that part of the conversation has a little bit dropped off. And so I think that is gonna be, you know, the challenge is finding that commonality of language. Again, it's not just about we do ways together and we do all the Silicon Valley stuff together. That's a piece of it, it's, but it's only a piece of it. It's about both commonality of advancing our common interest against common enemies or in the cyber field, but, and, and, and technology and economics, but it's also about the, the common values. Um, so I really thought I would take on three kind of pieces here for uh, given the limited time I have. And it's, I hope we'll have questions on this because I'm not gonna do justice to any of them in, in the, like the nine minutes I have left. So it's the normalization part, the Iran part and the Palestinian part. Let me start with the, with the normalization part. And uh, what, you know, when we look at where we, we stand now on normalization, uh, what has been achieved. And this is what I think, you know, it's important if you, if you look at, you know, we, we, we have a common, the, the numbers here with the Emirates are like off the charts. Uh, sovereign wealth fund, $1.3 trillion, invest in high tech startups and things like that around the world. Uh, how many, like 130,000 Israelis traveling even during a pandemic. Uh, so this is a country, Israel, which has 4 million, 4.3 million Israelis that, that travel abroad uh, pre-pandemic and we assume post-pandemic. So almost half the country travels. It's, it's unheard of. I think certainly much bigger than the United States percentage wise. And uh, so the, the commonality here is, is, is very hopeful. This is a rocket ship. If, if the peace agreements between Egypt and Jordan were about strategic pieces between governments, which, have, which has held, if you look at the fact that Israel's best relations in the Arab world have been with Arab militaries in Jordan and in Egypt, and frankly with the Palestinian Authority, that now it's gonna be more of a peace between peoples, people that have no baggage because they never fought each other on the, on the, bag, on the battlefield. And, the, and I think it's also, you know, the, the, the discourse is gonna change in the Arab media. I don't wanna overstate, I don't wanna overstate, but it's not irrelevant that if you look at the Emirates here, on the right, you see um, uh, this Abrahamic house that the Pope dedicated, which is gonna have a mosque, a church, and a synagogue. The synagogue is gonna face Yerushalayim. The mosque is gonna face Mecca. Uh, there's nowhere else in the Arab world like that. Uh, not mentioning, uh, you know, menorahs and all that stuff. And, uh, but I mean, if you look also at the Saudi prince, I mean, the Saudi's prince Bandar bin Sultan, on Arabic uh, television, Al Arabiya, one of the most popular Arab satellite stations, really trying to reshift the the discourse by saying, "Look, it's not just a victimhood kind of narrative here about the Palestinians. There were a lot of missed opportunities." I'd urge you all to go on YouTube and put in Bandar Bil Sultan three nights in a row, like a documentary about all the missed opportunities on peace. Uh, and uh, and I think this could help shift. Uh, a new discourse here. It'll take a long time, but it's a beginning. And he, so what could Biden do? Could they do some interim moves with the Saudis? The Saudis have already done the overflights of El Al. The Bahrainis say to me, no way they could have done this treaty uh, normalization without the king of, of, of Saudi Arabia. I don't think the Saudis can fully normalize because the king at this age, he's committed to the classic paradigm of the Arab Peace Initiative, which is the Arab states do nothing until the Palestinians get everything. I think what's shifted with, uh, is that in 18 years, these Arab states don't want to put their own bilateral interest with Israel on hold. If we look at, at a map, I mean, if we look at a table, where, where could we see under Biden? You know, I don't think there's a lot of these countries I don't think is possible. But I think some of the countries on the right, I do think you could see at least partial moves. Will it Biden prioritize normalization? I think in some ways like the Emirati case, uh, where it wasn't initiated by Trump or, or Netanyahu, it was in, initiated by the Emiratis themselves. The, the Trump peace plan hit a wall and then the uh, annexation debate hit a wall and then uh, the Emiratis swooped in and they brought that to the US. So I think it's gonna be Israel and the Arabs uh, doing some of the lifting and then bringing it to the United States. But I think there's some things here that can be done. Uh, and, and of course, uh, if we just look very quickly at the polls, very quickly what we see certainly 
with Israel, the breakthrough is amazing with Israelis can always agree what they have. The week it is, 75% believe this improves Israel standing in the Middle East. And if you look in terms of the Arab polling, you know, we see here too, uh, a broad support for these agreements. And we even have a poll that says, this is what we like, but even what we think will be, the numbers are even higher, that there will be more of these sorts of normalization agreements. So I think the fact that Biden and Trump couldn't agree on anything, but they agreed on normalization, the issue isn't just what do you support, what exists, you invest in the next phase in some of these other countries. What Danny said is true. This, this administration is going to have a very full plate. COVID, 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 economic implications of COVID, that's going to dominate everything. China and climate change are also going to be first tier issues. This might not be, but I do think if they see an opportunity, they will seize it. But I think it shouldn't wait for the administration if the Arabs and the Israelis have to kind of uh, come together on this. Uh, and then come to the administration because this this is a president that actually he likes this and so does uh, Tony Tony Blinken the the, the 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 Secretary of Defense the Secretary of State and Jake Sullivan people we know uh, I think very centrist uh, people now let me just move quickly to Iran and look at some numbers here uh, on on Iran I think the 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 data in terms of uh, you know once once the United States left the agreement. Then so did the Iranians. Uh, I mean, they've been they're enriching to 20% purity. What you see with this chart here, to get to 20% is uh, you know is is about 90% of the way of getting to 90%. Even though you would think 20% is far from 90%. So leaving the agreement did have a big impact. And um, so to go from reactor grade at 20% to weapons grade at 90% purity, uh, it's not a huge leap. But they, you know, they say, you, you're out, okay, we're out. So they have now done over 2,400 kilo, according to the International Atomic Energy Agency. The JCPOA only permits 300 kilo. And um, this has meant that the breakout time, meaning to go from reactor grade quality of uranium, remember, to get a bomb, you need three things. You need a missile, they got that. You need detonators, who knows if they have that, you'll never find it, it's a needle in a haystack. The one thing you can measure is nuclear fuel. So that's why all the focus is on the uranium issue. But I think the point here is, is that um, you know, the United States, and I'll get to in a minute, has said things that Israel actually wants to hear. I don't think it gets a lot of play in Israel, but it, it's, it's not a bad beginning. But so you've got a, a problem of the Iranian violations and the economic data shows you that Iran is vulnerable. It's real has lost 50% of its value against the dollar in 2020. 90% of its reserves are frozen. Uh, the GDP has declined by 11% since 2018. Its living standards have dropped. There's a loss of oil exports. The unemployment uh, is, is, at least the official unemployment was near 11. I think the unofficial unemployment is much higher. Uh, inflation, uh, as we said, when we talked about the real, is very high. So the sanctions have had an impact. That's the good news. The not as good news is, is that pressure is not just economic pressure. It's political pressure. And for political pressure, you need allies. We went to the Security Council in the last few months of the Trump administration to get snapback sanctions on Iran. We only got three votes under Trump out of 15. Now for America, it's kind of disgraceful because we're usually bring people along with us. We couldn't bring anyone along with us. So I tend to think that the opening position of a new administration economics is good. But now the question is what can be done? And that'll bring me to slide with Tony Blinken and these are some of the statements as the new Secretary of State. He said things, I, I watched like two Israeli news network shows in Hebrew a day in prime time. He said things, but they don't get picked up. He said, we got to consult Israel in the Gulf states early. Uh, here's the quote that he said right here. He said, no return to the JCPOA, as Biden has said, until they comply. What they mean complying means they have to kick out, they have to get rid of all this excess low and rich uranium, over 2,000 kilos, which is enough like to make two bombs. And he says, we got to lengthen and strengthen. I always want to get to the core of an issue. I don't like to dance around an issue. I want to get to the heart of it. And I think here, so the good news is there's this consultation. I think um, the problem is in Israel doesn't hear it, but you've got a whole progressive wing, as, as Danny said. I think they're almost looking for Israel to trip up, to say, here, you know, Blinken says we'll extend a hand. And instead, uh, you know, we'll say, you know, we don't believe you. And uh, some of the statements, I think, of, of the chief of staff, 
uh, last week at the INSS of Aviv Kochavi, I think are going to be misinterpreted here. Um, is saying as if to say, you know, the U.S. says they want to consult you early, so before they lock in, that's a good thing, and it shouldn't be seen as saying, you know, we're, we're against anything. He didn't say we're against anything, but that was the way it was picked up here. Uh, the Kochavi's remarks. The next slide here is just simply. Um, you know, both the U.S. and Israel say, look, here's the goal. We want to get to JCPOA 2.0. That means a longer sunset clause, meaning more restrictions on their ability to do uranium for a much longer time. We want to bring in ballistic missiles, and we want to bring in Iran's regional malign behavior. But the question is, and here's going to be the issue, and I always want to get to the heart of it. The heart of it here is the next slide, is does the road to 2.0 go through 1.0, and how does the U.S. maintain leverage in the negotiation? Israel is going to worry that you know, Iran wants to reaffirm where things were before saying, let's think about broadening it, because let's get to 1.0. And the US, Israel's gonna say, are you gonna give away your leverage? Are you gonna lift these sanctions? This is your leverage to get to 2.0. Um, and that's gonna be the, the consultation, which is a philosophical one, which is what is the role of leverage in the talks? And how do you make sure that 2.0 is just in merely aspirational to deal with Iran's malign regional activity and the like, um, but it's a real plan. And what, what I think, and I will say something nice here on the Trump administration, what it did learn was that, uh, that the treasury, the United States treasury, the banks in the world tend to be very conservative and they don't wanna run afoul of, of the United States treasury. And if they have to choose between doing business with American banks or Iranian banks, it didn't matter that the Brits, the French, the Germans, the Chinese, the Russians weren't in part of it. Nobody wanted to get on the wrong side of the American banking system. So there is still leverage out there. And the question is, how is that going to be dealt with? We don't really have time because I want to stick to my limit. So I'll, I'll, I'll deal with it in uh, just like a minute or two. And that is the issue of the Palestinian issue, which we have maps for that too. I agree with Danny that there's going to be no huge initiative here because of the other agenda, and also because the Venn diagram right now between Netanyahu and Abbas on final status doesn't really overlap much. And the US has tried in 2000, 2007, 8, 2013, 14, that I was a part of, and Trump too, 2020, to hit what we call the home run ball, to, or you'd say in Israel, to run the marathon. And uh, whenever you try to do it all, the Talmud said, tafasta marubalo tafasta, you, you overreach. And so I think you're going to have a case of a president and a secretary of state who've got other priorities, but are going to want to do incremental things in this regard, including they're going to want to restore U.S.-Palestinian relations in, in the first few months, uh, given the boycott that's existed since 2017. Then there's some other ideas. I don't have time right now, but I hope in the, in the discussion we'll, we'll get to some of those points. And again, I want to thank Paul and, and the Begin Center for, for the Zoom hospitality. Great, thank you very much, David. Um, great presentation and, and, and very enlightening comments. Um, before we go to questions <clears throat> from the audience, um, Danny, did you want to respond to anything David said? As, he, as, as uh, you went first, he had the opportunity to respond a bit to you. No, no, that's okay. I, I, I agree with most of the things he said, so no need to respond. Okay, okay, we're all, we're all friends here. Um, Okay, so uh, there's been a, a bunch of questions. Um, the, one, of the, um, <clears throat> one of the things that's making headlines here in Israel, and you can judge for yourselves whether it should be, should or not, is the fact that President Biden has not yet called Netanyahu. Is, is that something, and either one of you can answer this, or both of you can answer this, do you, um, does that have a lot of significance for you, or you think it's an overblown point? Danny? I don't think it's I don't think it's too significant. Actually, I, I must admit that I didn't check the president the precedents uh, when the previous presidents uh, uh, called the prime minister of Israel after entering office. But I understand that uh, President Biden only called to this point only a handful of uh, leaders, mainly European and uh, Western Hemisphere leaders. So. And, and the, 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 the Middle East is not yet, um, uh, he, he is not dialed to the Middle East yet, so I assume that uh, I will not be surprised if Prime Minister Netanyahu is the first Middle Eastern leader uh, President Biden calls. 
Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, look, uh, Ben Shabbat, Mayor Ben Shabbat, what the Israelis call MBS, the uh, National Security Advisor uh, of Israel, spoke to his counterpart, Jake, uh, Jake Sullivan, in the first few days. And I think they're going to have a good, warm relations. I'm sure Tony and uh, Gabi are going to work well together, although there's Israeli elections coming up. Um, so, and, and it's and it just really, I know you've been following the news reports out of Israel. It's really, I cannot understate enough the, the pressure the president is under uh, trying to work with the Republicans now to get this $1.9 trillion COVID package going. You know, it's not like Israel, you know, it's amazing that you had an American product at Pfizer and Moderna and the Israelis are almost done and, you know, with two, but certainly not in the United States. And, uh, and no one, there's not much public interest on anything outside of COVID right now. And I know that's true in Israel too. So I have no doubt that they'll talk very soon, but uh, there's, there's a lot of else going on right now. Yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult. Sometimes I think it's difficult for Israelis to appreciate that, um, that America is, uh, is we're, I think Israelis on, on both sides of the map are so busy worrying about what the new administration is gonna say or do with regard to Israel, it forgets sometimes that that, that, that the president has um, has other things on his on his plate. Um, uh, there was a cup. There were a couple of questions about Vice President Harris, um, Danny Diane. I know you said you. Uh, I, I noted you, you you spoke very deliberately. You didn't just say that you thought that Biden was the best candidate for pre for president of the Democratic candidates. You actually said the Biden Harris team was was a was a was positive can you can maybe you say something about i know when you were in uh, in position in new york you spent an awful lot of time and energy um getting to know democrats very deliberately um did you oh, meet, sure i think that my did you no, meet, i didn't meet the senator harris i didn't meet senator harris because she's from california and i was in charge of uh, the northeast uh, so uh, no i didn't but uh, obviously as an observer i I followed also her, and uh, I really uh, disagree totally with those that characterize uh, Vice President Harris as uh, be belonging to the radical or, or anti for sure, the anti-Israeli wing of the Democratic Party. I think that uh, Vice President Harris is a friend of Israel. We can work with her. I see no sign whatsoever on the contrary. Thank you. David, for those of us that don't know much about her, can you say something about her as, a, as in terms of her, um, um, her um, connection with, such as it has been in her, in her relatively short career as senator um, with Israel and the Middle East? Look, I think she's trying to surround herself with people who are very friendly with Israel. And I know people have spoken to her privately. People forget something, that she was a, an attorney general uh, of a state. And the attorney generals deal with, you know, I don't know what we would call it, uh, you know, terrorism and this criminality is different, but, but she's not one of these like kumbaya, just like if we only hold hands with each other, we solve every problem. Attorney generals, you got to be tough in pursuing people and uh, you know some bad elements. And I think that she, uh, people have talked to her privately, and when they say, you know, if you were Israel, would you trust so and so who, you know, is you know, is never said, you know, committed themselves to, to working with Israel? And she goes, I wouldn't trust that. I mean, I I think she's got a healthy skepticism for. Uh, things that are not real and tangible. And uh, I think people would be doing a disservice to caricature her in any way. Great, thank you very much. Um, Danny, this By the way, I, I, we, forgot, we forgot to mention, Paul, that uh, Defense Minister Benny Gantz and Secretary Austin, Secretary of Defense, had a phone call, I think, in, in really in the virtually the, the first week of uh, uh, Secretary Austin after his confirmation. Right, right, very, very, good. very important to, to note that. Um, Danny, this one's for you. Um, there was a question asking you to uh, expand, if you can, on your comments about speaking Democrats. And specifically, what specifically what sort of, what sort of advice would you have for Gilad Ardan and other Israeli diplomats about how best to um, 
how best to communicate Israel's needs um, uh, to the Biden administration? Look, uh, it's not necessarily about the specific needs for the Biden administration. It's a, it's a way of bonding or reconnecting uh, with the Democratic Party that, you know, the statistics show that uh, we lost a lot of support among liberals, among Democrats. I'm not only talking about, you know, the Democratic Party as a political organization, also about the liberal uh, US civil society that ultimately those are the persons who go to vote and elect their senators and members of Congress and their presidents. Um, and um, it's very, I mean, what we call sometimes, uh, I see that is seen as a derogatory term, what we call Hasbara, uh, is about uh, making the other side, in this case, Americans to understand, to understand Israel. But, uh, you know, it takes two to tango. And in order to recreate the, the, the bond that existed between Israel and the Democratic Party, we also need to understand, we Israelis need to understand the Democratic Party. And as I said, uh, or I hinted previously, I think that many Israelis are still uh, figuring uh, liberal America uh, 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 and the Democratic America that doesn't exist anymore. Um, that, uh, you know, in a democratic party and a liberal America, they basically was about uh, fulfilling the American dream. And uh, as I said earlier, uh, showing, uh, showing uh, respect to, to Martin Luther King and uh, to LGBT rights and a little bit of uh, a grain or two of social justice. And that was the democratic party. The Democratic Party today is a completely different creature. And we have to understand it. It's not something, you know, or you can like it or not, but it's not something artificial. It's, it's, that is the reality right now. And I, I must say that uh, you cannot reconnect uh, in depth with the Democratic Party without understanding uh, the minorities. Um, uh, without understanding, as I said earlier, what is the narrative of the African-Americans, it's very tempting for Israelis to say those rioters and this and that, uh, and uh, neglect uh, the causes of uh, 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 those demonstrations and uh, the frustration that African-Americans, rightly or wrongly, but genuinely feel. And uh, the, the, our bonding with the Latino community, our outreach to the, in order to reach out to the Latino community that will be, they will decide elections in, in two decades. Uh, we have to understand the, the Latino community. It's not about, uh, you know, the uh, religious beliefs and uh, it's, 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 a, it's a way of thinking, it's a way of seeing history, it's a way of seeing the reality about immigration and about social justice, etc. And unfortunately, I don't think that uh, Israeli leaders and Israeli diplomats uh, are prepared enough you know, to do that. Um, I, uh, I tried to, I tried to, did, to do it in, in New York uh, to, to the extent that I could, um, but uh, um, I, I, I have to tell you, without doing that, uh, we will not, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's unrealistic to expect them to understand us if we don't understand them and we don't talk the same language. And uh, yeah, America is greater than Israel, as you know, a little bit slightly greater. And yes, we have to adapt to them to a large extent. If we, if, to, 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 to expect America to start thinking like Israel is a not that we will be able to understand the way American thinks is not a good strategy, it's not a good tactic. And uh, that's, what, that's what we have to do without compromising, uh, obviously, our beliefs, our interests. It's not about that. Is about uh, uh, using uh, uh, vocabulary, using uh, arguments um, that appeal to them, that appeal to their hearts. And yes, they are very different from the arguments and vocabulary that appeal, for instance, to evangelicals. And uh, I, I think that Israelis know uh, how to talk to, uh, to evangelicals 
and we lost to a, a, great, a great extent the ability to talk to, to those groups. And that is vital for Israel's interest. Crucial. Can I get in here on this, Paul? Please, thank you. Yeah, look, I, I agree with everything Danny just said. And look, I, the truth is, and how I, I think for the most part, people in the audience, I hopefully would uh, on Zoom or uh, YouTube uh, have agreed with what a lot of what we said. You know, here's a little part where it's going to be a little harder. Um, and I preface it obviously by Israel has to always, you know, defend itself by itself. And Israel's got to be security above all. But I will tell you, I was in a conversation once with Condoleezza Rice when she was Secretary of State, and she's not a progressive Democrat, uh, right? She was a Secretary of State for George W. Bush, who was very, uh, you know, supportive of Israel in many ways. And she, in a conversation that I would have with the group, and it's things she said publicly also, so I don't feel like I'm like giving away any confidences, which I would never do otherwise. But she wanted to compare the Palestinians to growing up in Montgomery, Alabama uh, during the civil rights movement, you know? And some of us have said, you know, if, 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 if Yasser Arafat would have been Martin Luther King, the Palestinians would have had a state 50 years ago. So there's differences, but it's hard for Israelis to get this point. I realize this, but there are gonna be people that are gonna look at the Palestinian issue through that lens of their own minority experiences whether they're Democrats or Republicans. And that's just the way it's gonna be. And look, I'm, I'm, I'm worried as someone who has devoted his life to a, a very robust uh, US-Israel relationship and not seeing it's uh, exclusive. I want all good alliances with, for the United States with the Arabs as well. I'm worried that the lack of progress, I don't think we could hit the home run ball as I keep saying, that, uh, that we go for the, the marathon, we're gonna fail. We go for the home run, we'll fail. We should go for a single or, a, you know, 5K. But I believe without any progress, people, uh, and I think this will resonate with the minorities, is okay, you don't want two states, fine. Let's have one state and let everybody vote. That's the DNA of America. And there's a carve out on this issue. And I feel that, uh, and I know Danny might not agree with me either, but I, I think that, that I want the, the special relationship between US and Israel to survive forever, you know, many, as far as the eye can see, indefinitely. But I'm worried the more there's no progress on this issue, the more that some of these other narratives are gonna use their lens to look at this issue. And, uh, and, and the US-Israel relationship will be at risk. Not tomorrow morning under Joe Biden, for sure not. But over time, as these, some of these other constituencies great gain political power. And I think that's something Israel needs to take into account, this looming thing of the one state. Not that Israel will ever give over the keys. It should never give over the keys. Israel's identity is Zionism. That's what it's all about. That's why there's an Israel that the Jews have one country in the world they can go to. But people will say, you don't want two states? Then let everyone vote. Mm -hmm. And even if Israel says, no, I worry that now we have fringe voices in America talking one state, that those voices will get more and more to the mainstream. And I think Israelis have to hear it. And I, I'm saying it out of love that uh, they need, I feel they need to hear it because there are other constituencies and they're not just in the Democratic Party. The demography of America is changing. And um, I think it's something you have to take into account. And I think you have to do it, of course, in a way that preserves Israeli security above all. Okay. Thank you very much for that, and thank you, Danny, for your for your comments as well. Um, it's uh, it it made me uh, it it did make me wonder whether, uh, um, with all due respect to uh, to Gidon Sar um, uh, and to Gilad Erdan, whether you'd be better, whether we would be better off if you were uh, running for the uh, ambassadorship uh, position. Um, there's a question, David. Maybe I'll I'll put this to you, uh, and Danny, you can also comment as well. Of course, um, there was a question about the Palestinians and whether. Um, they are likely to um, re revive the v their veto uh, or their campaign against the normalization agreements now that they have a, a more friendly administration or at least an administration that isn't that isn't very much um, sort of hadn't sort of cut cut ties with them as the Trump administration had. Maybe I'll broaden that out. David, I know you follow the Palestinian side of things as well. Um, how do you see the Palestinians generally responding to the Biden administration? 
Okay, I, these are good questions. Look, I think it's clear that, uh, you know, Abbas blew it in August, September, October period. I, I jokingly say that uh, if the Khartoum agreement was the, the three no's, you know, of, of 1967, no negotiations, no peace, no recognition of Israel, uh, now Khartoum is made normalizing with Israel. And now there was a Zoom call. Remember 1979 when, when Sadat made his treaty, the Arab League moved for a decade, a decade to Tunisia uh, in protest. And now on one Zoom call, uh, when the Palestinians said, hey, we're against this normalization deal, they didn't swing one state. So we've gone from Khartoum to Zoom. It's a real shift in, in, in the dynamic. And I think for people that I know, on the Israeli side who follow Abbas very, very closely up front uh, uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the official side, they certainly think he is uh, like a phoenix rising from the ashes with the Biden victory, that he understands they misplayed it. He sent his ambassadors back to all those countries that he condemned, uh, like the Emirates, Bahrain, et cetera. When the normalization with Morocco came out, he refused to condemn it. Um, and he just knows like he's got one chance of making a positive impression. And I think he wants to um, now go much more pragmatically. That might explain the focus on elections, although elections is it, the West Bank is a whole conversation. But, um, but I think he wants to make a good impression. In my view, the way he can make the best impression is to deal with it, what we, we call the Taylor Force issues. He's got to deal with prisoner payments. Uh, on his side. Uh, that means that if they want to get funding from the US Congress, they need to change their system that it's not the longer you stay in an Israeli prison, the more money you get. Um, and we know this from Shin Bet people who have intercepted uh, people on the way to terrorist attacks that there was, they felt an incentive system. And maybe you could say that's a holdover from a pre-Oslo period but it's got to end and there'll be no congressional funding unless they change that way. And we hear that they have had a lot of internal conversations, but if they really want to make an impression in Washington, they have to do, in my view, and get money. They've got to, the first step is in Ramallah before you get to Washington. Uh, on the U.S. side, what it'll do, we didn't have really have time to get into this because of time constraints is I do think the U.S. wants to open up a consulate, uh, reopen it. That was there really, I think since 1844, and uh, it will be a symbolic move that it wants to hear more. Uh, I think that will happen. I think the PLO office in Washington, though, is, is a little more complicated, in which I could explain why. But I think you'll see some moves that are symbolic moves in the next few months. But that should not be confused with saying now the U.S. wants to do, you know, try to hit the home run ball again. So I think they want to end the boycott, re-engage and uh, make some hopefully incremental steps, but I don't think it's gonna, the president and the secretary of state, they've got a lot of other issues and they just don't think it'll work. If they thought it would work, they would put aside time, they just don't. So I think it's gonna be more modest, but uh, I do think there'll be a few steps in the next few months. Thank you, thank you. Danny, did you wanna comment on that at all? I think that, uh, you know, uh, um, we, we will see some, as I said, the confidence building measures by the administration towards the Palestinians. Uh, uh, some of the things are uh, fait accompli, like the embassy in Jerusalem. Uh, I'm not sure regarding the consulate general in Jerusalem. On the other hand, uh, uh, very probably uh, 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 the PLO office will be reopened in, in in uh, Washington, even if there are some legal uh, problems, uh, but I believe that they will find a solution for that. Uh, but, you know, uh, uh, ultimately, uh, as I said, I don't see a, a, a big move uh, in the Palestinian uh, area. I don't have, I don't think that the Palestinians have any veto power regarding normalization in other countries, Biden or Trump in the, in the Oval Office, it doesn't matter. Uh, they, have, they are not in a position to, to veto any uh, 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 further agreement. I hope, I sincerely hope, I already spoke about Saudi Arabia, I, I, I hope that the Biden administration will be wise enough to, to advance normalization between Israel and Saudi Arabia, not uh, 
put obstacles in that because of their dislike of the of the Saudi uh, uh, attitude to, to different issues. Um, but you know, uh, and the big issue of the peace process, um, you know, there was a tradition that every new president, American president that comes to office and that is inaugurated takes us, in one hand takes our risk, on the other hand, he takes the Palestinians' risk and jumps, runs and jumps together with us into the swimming pool of the peace process. The only problem was that no president checked if there is any water in the swimming pool and we usually cracked our skulls, including the president, the American president's skull. I think that that lesson has been learned and uh, I don't see uh, President Biden and not even Secretary Blinken uh, adapt, adopting that uh, failed strategy. Can I just add one thing on the on the regional piece, which I uh, I think is really important, is that is that the you know I think you could look at the normalization issue as looked at on some on the on the right as as a bypass road around the Palestinian issue, and people are happy there. There are people on the left that see it as a bypass road. And they're, they're very upset. They're in mourning over those, those normalization agreements because they think it's a dilution of leverage to deal with the Israel and the Palestinian issue. So the, the right and the left edges have more in common on normalization uh, that they both think it's a bypass road. I think the most people though, I, I believe and I hope are more in the middle and they think it's not a bypass road but it could be a bridge. Uh, and instead of the Palestinians uh, cursing MBZ and Mohammed bin Zayed of the uh, United Arab Emirates, they need to coax MBZ. They need to find ways to get the Arab states more engaged. Uh, there's the bin Zayed neighborhood in, in Gaza. Mohammed bin Zayed could build like two cities in the West Bank easily. Uh, and there's no reason for the Palestinians to antagonize them. I know there's bad blood over Mohammed Dahlan, who's, who's who was in Abu Dhabi. I, I saw him when I was in Abu Dhabi before COVID. And they, they like him a lot there, uh, the leadership, um, the, the Ben Zayed brothers, Mohammed Ben Zayed, Abdullah Ben Zayed, the foreign minister, and uh, uh, Tahnun Ben Zayed, the national security advisor. They're very close with him. But I think you could find a way. And, and, and the, the policy form I did at the Washington Institute two days ago with Yosef Otebo, who I see as the real architect of the Abraham Accords, the Emirati ambassador, you know, he said, if, look, if we're asked to contribute, you know, but we want a plan, we want transparency, you know, we want to help. So I think the Arab states can be useful. That was uh, the point of my transition paper, including these incremental states with the, with the Saudis. I think the Arab states could be helpful. And we saw this with, with Menachem Begin's peace with Egypt, and we saw it with the Jordan peace. It's once these countries join the circle of peace, they actually get more engaged in trying to bring others in because uh, they don't want to be alone. And so I, I think it should not be seen as an either or proposition. The old paradigm of 2002, the API, the Arab Peace Initiative is dead because it was based on the idea that the Arab states do nothing with Israel. And um, the fact, the, until the Palestinians get what they want, but something happened in 18 years, the classic API did not work and the Middle East changed. And the US, you got two administrations, tr Obama and Trump that pulled troops out. They, you know, as the Emirati said, you know, every day you talk about energy independence in America, you think we don't hear you? We hear you loud and clear. And we're wondering who can we count on if the US is pulling back, not fully pulling out, but pulling back. You know, one state is one Emirati official said to me in Abu Dhabi, a national security official said to me, he goes, David, look, we don't know what America's gonna do, but we know there's one country that we could count on that won't leave the Middle East because they live in the Middle East, that's Israel. And I think here, the sense of aligned regional thinking uh, that who could fill this vacuum that the, you know, you talk to the Israelis, you talk to the Emiratis, you close your ears, you, you close your eyes. You don't know who you're talking uh, more about when it comes to Iran when it comes to jihadi, when it comes to the Muslim Brotherhood, there's aligned regional thinking, and that's going to bring these countries close. And now the key is to bring the, the Arab states into this too on, on the Palestinian peacemaking and, you know, cut the BS and, 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 and try to find ways uh, for there to be progress. Again, not all at once, 
And uh, I think that's, that I don't see that coming uh, in, in the short term. But I think incrementally there are things you could do, you know? And I think the United States, we, we, we internalize the Palestinian critique by saying gradualism has its limits of the 90s, if you talk about the Clinton years. But, you know, we tried it now four times their way uh, by going to the final status. And I think the gaps are there. So whenever it's all or nothing in the Mideast, it's nothing. So I think we got to do gradualism and we have to enlist the Arab states in, in this regard. And we should think bridges and not bypass roads. Thank you. You're fair. Okay. Um, uh, we're, we're over the hour, but there are, maybe I could ask one more question. And before I do that, I'm just going to tell people to check on the chat, um, not the Q&A, the chat um, where um, there's a couple of Washington Institute links um, that David's assistant has kindly supplied, which may be of interest. Also, my email is there. Um, please, if you're not on my mailing list and would like to be, um, I don't send spam, don't worry. Um, you can uh, email me, paulg at begincenter.org.il. It's written in the chat and I will add you to my mailing list and let you know about all the uh, things that we are doing here in English uh, for English speakers, uh, including next week, um, a talk with um, Shabatai Shavit, the former um, head of the Mossad, about his uh, new uh, or new in English uh, memoir. Um, and I'll conclude with this question. Um, uh, Danny, I'll start with you on this as it's a sort of internal Israeli question, um, but I, I'd be very happy to hear David's views as well. Um, David uh, mentioned in his initial presentation how um, IDF Chief of Staff uh, Aviv Kochavi's remarks uh, were interpreted in the US. Um, who do you think Kochavi was directing those remarks to? Maybe I'll just say for those that aren't aware that Chief of Staff Kochavi gave some very blunt, unusually blunt remarks at a conference, uh, I think last week, uh, in which he basically um, cautioned against uh, America rejoining the JCPOA uh, under any circumstances. It was un unusually um, uh, harif, as we would say, in Israel um, uh, statement. Well, you know, it, I, I, I don't know exactly uh, how that uh, speech was crafted. Uh, I really don't know if it was uh, the prime minister's initiative or the minister of defense initiative, even if they denied that. They said that they, didn't, they weren't aware, but doesn't necessarily mean they were <laughs> saying the truth. Uh, so, if um, that was uh, the case, that uh, he was doing it at the Prime Minister's initiative, then, uh, and I will say here a very domestic Israeli thing, um, it's quite refreshing that the uh, top army general reflects the position of the elect democratically elected government and doesn't make remarks that are later used by uh, the American administration or the Europeans or others in order to attack or to hinder the position of uh, the Israeli democratically um, elected government. We have seen that uh, during the Obama days in which uh, the Obama administration used quotes by uh, IDF and Mossad uh, uh, top officers in order to argue against the Israeli position. Uh, so that uh, is uh, bad from an ethical, bad from a democratic uh, point of view. And if uh, General Kochavi, Lieutenant General Kochavi, the Chief of Staff, this, I mean, uh, spoke in order to reinforce the, uh, the, the position of the elected government of Israel, that is, as I said, refreshing and positive. Regarding the content, I mean, should the prime minister or the minister of defense through the chief of staff uh, now be confrontational, I'm not sure. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure, it's, I'm, I'm not saying they shouldn't. It's a very delicate situation. We have, I mean, as the question we have to, to judge if it's a part of a, a, a robust and, 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 and complete strategy or not just, you know, a shot in the air that uh, causes more damage than a benefit. 
Look, I would just add that, you know, I understand if you're an Israeli citizen, you like the fact that actually you have an independent assessment of uh, what they call in Israel, you know, bitachon neto, you know, just net security from, uh, you know, from somebody who's not the prime minister, who you say your job is security. I want to hear you what you think. I think I understand how the idea of an independent kind of way of communication has a lot of appeal to Israelis. And I'm not questioning that. I, I mean, he did say, to be fair, Paul, I, I actually heard his remarks when he said them. I was w listening and watching them on YouTube and uh, in real time. And uh, he didn't say he was against any agreement under any circumstances at the current agreement uh, or with a few uh, shipurim, as he called a few improvements. Right. Uh, but he was open to other things. Look, I think he has the right as the, as the you know, it's true. Gadi Eisenkot spoke at the same INSS conference four years ago. And, and talked about some of the values uh, of JCPOA. So, you know, uh, you know, it's interesting. I was both at an INSS annual conference. I just think sometimes timing is everything. And you're just at a very uh, delicate juncture here uh, where you want to start off on a good foot with the new administration. And this new administration wants to show that it's not the Obama administration, that it is the Biden administration. And wants to emphasize what Tony said, what Tony Blinken said in his hearing when he said, we want to be with you at the takeoff, so we'll be together at the landing. That was the perfect tone. Not only do we want to consult, but we want to consult early. By consulting early, you have a half, you have a chance to try to shape our policy. And I understand the prime minister's going to the Gulf on Sunday, I believe, uh, to, to, to try to get a coordinated approach with, the, with some of the Gulf states. And I get that. And that's his right. But I think when, when the administration is trying to go out of its way to say, here's an extended arm, we want to work with you early before we lock in, I think, you know, I wish Kohavi would have said, the U.S. wants to consult with us. I have my point of views on this agreement, and I will express them in these consultations, but I welcome the fact that the administration from the very first day is reaching out to us. That I think is good. So timing, I do think, is important here because I think there are elements, you know, out there in the United States that would love to seize on this, to say, here, we extended a hand, you gave us a clenched fist. And that I think is wrong. And uh, I, I wouldn't want to make it easy for those people. So I, I just think consult, 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 and do it early in the way the US said. Now it could be, I'm not predicting there's going to be great harmony as a result of the consultation, but if the administration is extending a hand, take it. And uh, so timing, I think is everything. Okay, thank you both very, very much. Um, I really don't think um, we could have had two more uh, knowledgeable, thoughtful, nuanced um, speakers on this um, hugely important issue. Um, Danny, Diane, uh, thank you very much. And um, uh, whatever, whoever, whoever we Israelis are voting for, um, I think um, your presence in Israeli politics and the Knesset um, and maybe the government as well uh, would be a welcome addition uh, and a hugely, hugely um, beneficial addition for the state of Israel. Um, David Mikowski, thank you very much. I urge everyone to check out um, Decision Points, David's podcast uh, and his recent book with Dennis Ross, um, um, Be Strong and of Good Courage. And thank you, everyone. I hope you join me next week uh, for the chat with uh, Shabtai Shavit. And uh, if you're not on my mailing list, email me, paulg at vegancenter.org.il. I wish you all a good day. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.